the Hodier family. We are back today with another video. Today we're just gonna be touching on how pro-blackness gets in the way of being African yes. and what that means in the American context and what that means for black Americans mm -hmm. in um, the States. Right, mm -hmm. and just as in all our videos, we'll be breaking it down very um, systematically mm -hmm. to kind of illustrate how um, a lot of the uh, discord and, and turmoil that we experience as black people is connected to the words we use, uh, specifically those words that we use to define ourselves. Right. Because how we define ourselves determines our fate. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to be very careful and deliberate in terms of the words we use. Right. Before we get into the conversation, which is long overdue, we want to do a quick shout out yeah, you know, to do. one of our sisters who is putting out very powerful mm -hmm. um, liberation type content yes, she um, is. for African people and um, her name is Tiffany Banner yeah. and, and she's only 19 years old 19. which is amazing it's crazy you know because if you look at her page she's putting out the type of content that is vital mm -hmm. uh, for the revitalization of African people yes. everywhere so do you want to speak a few words about yes. um, Tiffany so Tiffany like he said she's um, a young woman she's only 19 but she is like She's very serious about the liberation of African people. She's already booked her ticket to leave America permanently. So, like we said, if she's 19, right. you have no excuse as an right. adult. Right. Like, if she's serious about un and understanding the um, where America is going and she was very adamant about getting out on time, mm -hmm. like, she understands the urgency. She's not sitting around playing games. She's making videos. She's putting out content daily mm -hmm. about you know, African people and why it's so important for us to get out of this black mm -hmm. context and mm -hmm. get into our African selves. Yes, so yes. she is so amazing to watch. We love watching her. Yes, yes. So shout out to you, Tiffany. We'll link her channel below. Please make sure to go subscribe and watch her videos and get some of that knowledge that right, she has. Right, right. <laughs> it will be very beneficial. Yes, so. it will. Mm -hmm. So now we're about to go into the topic at hand, which is how the pro-black movement is in um, contradiction to the interest of African liberation, yes. African with the K. Right. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna break it down one by one and I, we have six points listed here. And on each point, we're gonna go through how specifically these behaviors are in contradiction to one another. Right. We're gonna list these points. One side is gonna be African yes. and one side is gonna be black. Yes. You can decide which category you fall into by if you these things apply to you right so we'll name these things right. and then you can kind of diagnose yourself and you can kind of because we, mm -hmm. we're all about growing yes. and you know we started off as pro-black so yes. we're not against that starting off as that what we're saying is you have to grow and evolve into, and evolve into something else so right. the first step to do that is identifying hey i might not be far enough i might be very pro-black and not enough Pro African, mm -hmm. <laughs> so African African centered, African -centered yeah. right? So what we're saying is we're gonna list these things, and you can kind of identify if you are falling in the category of being pro black or being African centered. And I think once you understand where you are, then you can better equip yourself to start moving elsewhere. So one, we're gonna start the pro black pro black desire desires equality, mm -hmm. and Africans fight for total separation and sovereignty. Total separation. Total separation. And that that disqualifies any argument about a nation within a nation. Yeah, we don't want We're, that. You know, that's nah. that's not the, the prescription we need in order to liberate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So what is why is it so bad to fight for equality? Um, personally, for me, I think if you look at the histor history um, between black people and white people, um, there's been so much trauma, so much genocide, so much killing mm -hmm. that to fight for equality um, with the white people mm -hmm. is to sell ourselves short. Exactly. It's to put ourselves on the same moral ground mm -hmm. as those who have committed just unthinkable crimes unthinkable. against humanity. Right. And, and we have to understand that we come from a legacy of Ma'at. And um, under the legacy of Ma'at, um, we don't... Um, comply or we don't make compromise with that which is um, at war with the Creator. So, um, and if we were to have a serious relationship with the Creator, mm -hmm. we would also 
take seriously the company we keep. Exactly. So, you Very know, and, and it goes back to the adage, you are the company you keep. Mm -hmm. So why would we want to maintain company with those who are um, fundamentally at odds with we, everything we that is, is holy and everything that is pure? Mm -hmm. Because we are people who hail from a sacred tradition. Mm -hmm. And in and, and every um, element of life, whether we're talking about spirituality, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about child rearing and our interpersonal relationships between right. man and woman, um, we have witnessed this um, campaign of defamation and this campaign that has forced us to engage in profane activities that take us out of our African self. Yeah. So, and that's why it's so necessary to um, enact a total separation for our own health and peace of mind. Because mm -hmm. once we have that total separation, then we'll have the, the kind of uh, wherewithal to establish true lasting sovereignty. Yes. So that's just a kind of a spiritual way of explaining um, a, a really a political movement that says African people can't be free until they resettle on the African continent. Yes, um, you know? we claim their land. And my husband and I, we, use, we talked about this earlier and we used the analogy that, you know, after a certain um, amount of times that you fail a class or you fail a course in school, it's, it gets to a point where, okay, well, now we understand that you're not going to pass this. You don't see a 21-year-old still in the fourth grade. or You know what I mean? Like, at, at some point, it gets to be, okay, you continuously fail this course, um, so we're just going to have to write you off. There right. is no more chances. And right. white people have continuously failed the course of humanity. Right. They have continuously, habitually failed the test. They have not passed. They can't pass. Yeah. So for us to ask for equality from them is crazy. It's like the person has failed mm -hmm. numerous hun hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. There is no more test for us to give. Mm -hmm. So and at this point, this is why we believe in separation and sovereignty outside of America. Because right. we understand that they haven't passed the test and they won't pass the test. Right, right. That passing grade has... has that's just a daydream. At this. Right. It's a pipe dream at this point. Exactly. So we're going to get into number two. Okay, so pro-black people pretend to celebrate ancestors, whereas Africans allow ancestors to work through them. Yeah. You know, so this is very important because now we're getting to the point of our connection with the ancestral realm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with pro-blackness, we confine um, our kind of recognition of our ancestors to Black History Month, to Juneteenth, or, to Dr. King's birthday, yeah. um, to different kind of celebrity culture, kind of um, homages to these mm -hmm. um, ancestors, but we really don't understand that as long as we think of our ancestors as the dearly departed, mm -hmm. then they can't uh, work with us in mm -hmm. the fights that we have to wage today. Right. And, and part of that is maintaining a, a regular communion with our ancestors, primarily through our study. You know, because yeah. when we study the works of our ancestors, that's our way of that's imbibing and taking in their spirit. That's how we commune with that's them. That's how we commune with them. And there's other ways to do it ritualistically through libations. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happened is we've kind of been lured into the spirituality that is completely emptied of any type of ancestral reverence. Mm -hmm. So when we go to church, um, we don't hear sermons about Matt Turner. We don't hear sermons about the great prophets of, of black history yeah. who have always understood that there's a connection between the earthly realm and the ancestral realm. Mm -hmm. And there is no kind of breakage, only the, and the breakage is, is an illusion, you know, because in actuality we are connected with them. But I think that that kind of severing of ties between us and our ancestors, mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest uh, tragedies, you know, um, in, the, in the history of African people as far as it goes to their first encounter with Europeans. Mm -hmm. So it's incumbent upon us to reestablish that bond with our ancestors beyond mere celebration, mm -hmm. but we have to enact what our ancestors wanted. Yeah. So when we made the transition to Africa, we understood that we was completing the mission that Marcus Garvey started. Right. Because Marcus Garvey never lived to see the African continent, but as people with the means and the ability to fulfill his dreams, we felt it our okay. responsibility to to do our part to advance the mission right. of, of total black liberation. So right. what do you have to say about this idea of um, pro-black people celebrating their ancestors, whereas African-centered people commune 
and, right. and, and really allow their ancestors to work through them. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how blackness is just an aesthetic thing. Yeah. Like, it's cool to have a t-shirt that says Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman <laughs> right. or I Am My Ancestors, yeah. but you don't even study their teaching. Yes. Like, you just know who they are be by through passing, but mm -hmm. you don't really commune with them. Mm -hmm. You don't really, but you would, you probably would be the one telling Harriet to stop. Mm -hmm. Tell them that not don't do it, Nat. That would have been you. But now it's okay for you to wear the t-shirts and and, a, and so what we are saying is pro blackness is is stopping you from really being able to commune with it with the ancestors because mm -hmm. you're so focused about posting them on black during Black History Month or wearing their t-shirt that you just negate their beliefs and right. you negate what they had to go through. Like right. these people died. Right. <laughs> like it wasn't a joke for them. Right. So I think that. Um, participating um, in that in the, those holidays and those rituals of pretending to celebrate your ancestors mm -hmm. is something that is a phenomenon amongst black people mm -hmm. in America mm -hmm. and it's it's really sad because you can see that based off of their actions based off of the overt docileness of black people in America mm -hmm. you can tell that they're not right. really right. they're not really believing what these people did right. or you're not really believing in what they went through so mm -hmm. it's like it's very just it's just something to do and it's, it's an aesthetic right and, and it's really it's really sad to watch. right and our ancestors i think what has to be understood is that their lives give us a responsibility beyond mere celebration so yeah. it's not enough to exalt them you have to emulate them yes. you know unless you're emulating your ancestors then they will turn their backs on you mm -hmm. and that's something um master teacher marimba ani about. talked about mm -hmm. she talked about how when we don't revere our ancestors they begin to fade away and we're at the point they turn now, their backs. and we're at the point now where I think we're approaching what I like to call ancestricide, which is the killing of our ancestors. And and if we don't want that to happen, then we will act intelligently and with um, purpose, and we won't allow them to be co-opted by commercial entities, or we won't allow celebrities to utter their names, um, Beyonce, or or anybody, any celebrity, to utter their names without doing the proper follow-up that, that, that we are required to do as true African people. Right. So we're gonna go into number three now. Pro-blackness uh, has no land base. Africans have a land base. So this is pretty you know, straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but there's a lot more to unpack even though it's straightforward and that's that any people with any true political weight in the world have to have a land to base their identity upon. Yes. So you Chinese people, they have China. Italian people have Italy. Irish people have Ireland. Jewish people have. Jewish people have Israel. You know, even though they stole it, but that's another story. <laughs> so, have. but every people <laughs> in the world, they base their power off of the fact that they have a land to refer to. And what's the power in the land? Well, the land provides you the sustenance mm -hmm. and the resources to build the institutions mm -hmm. that you can then defend and then you can practice your culture in, 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 in serenity and sovereignty. And sovereignty. Right. Now, black people, we're scattered. That's what the diaspora means. It means a scattering. So we have all a scattering of black people all over the world who are claiming these different nation states, mm -hmm. whether it be from Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad, Brazil, uh, Brazil America, uh, whatever uh, nation they claim, that gets in the way of that kind of fundamental reality that they will never have any true political power until they unite under one Pan-African flag. And you know who knew that? White people knew that. Yes. Like they, they wasn't, whoops, we just happened to put them yeah. all over the world yeah. by accident. Yeah. Like it was intentional. Right. So when you know that, right. you're, you start taking the steps to get back to right. where they ripped you from. Right, it's like the, the old African you know, proverb, I don't want to misstate it, but I, the idea is basically like um, one ant can't kill an elephant, but an army of ants can take down a lion. Okay. You know, like you have, you have to, it, there's power in unity. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand that uh, as long as we kind of hitch our identities to these national identities, mm -hmm. we're hitching our identity to the Europeans' um, identity. Yes. We're hitching our identity to a mentocidal identity that says everything that we do should be in the service of someone who doesn't look like us. Right in the service of someone who doesn't understand us on a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. And that's just committing uh, a people to uh, existence of 
suicide. Yes. You know, it's, it's literally you're 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 putting a ceiling on your ability, on your ability. to um, prosper yeah. as a race. Yeah. So we have to understand that moving to Africa is not just about this kind of fictionalized Wakanda, and that's something we're going to get in later. Like a lot of people you know, in America, especially, is they develop this kind of infatuation with this kind with of fantasy. fictional Africa. So they talk about Wakanda and Zamunda, but they don't talk about like Angola and Queen and Zimbabwe. Because they know they don't yeah. have to physically do anything right. to get there because right. they don't exist. Right. They don't talk about Burkina Faso and Thomas Sankara. Right. They don't talk about um, the Congo and Patrice uh, Lumumba. They don't talk about these things, but they, they hitch all of their identity on these fictionalized representations of Africa. Africa, and this is a way that um, the white society tries to dilute us of our serious commitment to Africa, which right. is not available for commercial capture. Right, right. It's in our, it's in our bones. It's in our DNA. Right. But we would have to access that ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't go to any studio to, to get it. In, in the studio us. that gave it to you, right. once you dead. Right. So it's like you can't, you can't put all your eggs into the basket of vibranium right. and cat suits. <laughs> right. Like we're talking. Can't. Yeah, they talk about vibranium, but what about solar, Gold. wind, hydroelectric power? We're living in currently in Zanzibar, Tanzania, and the like power, many, go the power the goes out all the time. This Africa, is the richest continent. The most resource-rich continent on Earth. On Earth. But power outages are just a routine thing. You talking about vibranium? Vibranium like, isn't going to keep the lights on in Africa, but that solar power, that wind power, that hydroelectric power, that geothermal power, that's going to keep the lights on, but it's not going to work in our favor until we start to claim those resources for Africans and not for Europeans. Right. So we're getting kind of off topic, but I felt that needed to be said yeah. because mm -hmm. a lot of times we we kind of get so sidetracked mm -hmm. by things that are not substantive. At all. And it, and it really undermines our thrust, yes. you know, uh, in, in fighting against this white supremacist system. We want the, we want the image. That's all yeah. we want. We don't want to have to work for it. We don't want to actually have to pack our stuff up and physically move. Right. Uproot. Uproot. Number four, uh, blackness appeals to the system for selfish liberation, Africans work outside the system for the liberation of the nation. So I want you to talk on this one because I think this this really speaks to the kind of nine to five, I'ma get mines, you better get yours, get the bad type culture that kind of severs us from any type of commitment to the whole of African people. Yeah, so we talked about this before, how America is and um, give you these little trinkets to keep you going mm. and you know it basically just makes you about yourself like mm. black people are always worried about what's going on with them mm. black people don't care about what that other black people are being killed and you can tell that because no white person has died mm. because of another black person being killed right. like they're just protesting wearing the t-shirts wearing a mask asking for reparations, asking for reparations mm. waiting for reparations mm -hmm. which is blasphemy right so you can kind of sense that these black people aren't really worried about all of us. Mm -hmm. They're worried about themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, African people worry about everybody, which mm -hmm. is why we take the time out to mm -hmm. take notes, mm -hmm. talk to each other, take notes, mm -hmm. sit down and create videos. Right. And why we actually left America, which was not easy to do. It was very stressful, yeah. but we did that because we understood that it's not about what, what's stressful for us. What's going to benefit all black people? Mm -hmm. Black people need to see a family leaving America and living in Africa. Yes, that's what they need to see. Yes. Selfish black people in America, they, they that's not even a concept for them. Like they can't even wrap their minds. Like I still have people sending me messages saying, "Did you really move?" Yeah, like it's obvious. <laughs> I said I moved like yeah. why would I lie yeah. like but for them it's like it's they literally can't conceptualize the idea mm -hmm. of leaving America and coming to Africa so right. and that's a very selfish mm -hmm. thing because this is where you are from right. like no Asian person will be see another Asian person move back to Asia um, or to, to China mm -hmm. and be like did you really move like <laughs> what you mean it's, it's not crazy but for black people it's like we're so selfish that we're like I can't put my wrap my brain around. Mm -hmm. That's the deciding factor between the two, and it's very obvious as well. Like you can you can clearly tell that we're not self centered. Yeah. Like we're not worried about just us. Mm -hmm. We're worried about African people as a whole, and we say that all the time at the end of our videos. Yeah. In America, 
it's very hard to care about other people because white people make it so that you only have time to focus on yourself. Right, right. It's so, a very individualistic it's a, exactly, society. Exactly. And I just want to speak briefly on the idea of appealing to the system for selfish liberation, mm -hmm. specifically on the um, item of reparations. Now, I've... I've been reading like the Bible, even the, the lost books of the Bible. Like there's plenty of books in the Bible that weren't included in the King James Version. Yes. That we should look at because we should have brought that book out. Yeah, we should have brought it out. We'll we'll do we'll another video it. on that. Yeah. But I've been mm -hmm. reading the Bible and I've just I'm starting to think about it on a more thematic level. And I've noticed that in the Bible, whenever there's an oppressed group, whenever that oppressed group wants liberation, they've never asked for reparations. Never. There's never been an exchange of money to remedy uh, injustice. You what just gonna die. <laughs> what happens is the wrath of God pours down on those people who committed the yes. injustice. And, and we can even look to texts that preceded the Bible. We can look to um, the ancient um, uh, kinetic come, come wisdom, which the, the book of coming forth by day, where you have this story of Asar, Aset, and Haru. Mm -hmm. So Set kills Asar, and, and uh, Haru uh, comes to life, and when Haru is born, does he ask Set for reparations? No, he takes vengeance for his, he avenges the honor of his father, mm -hmm. Asar, by right. going against it. Mm -hmm. And so we're saying as black people, even if all of the white people in the world pooled their money and gave it to us, that wouldn't count for 1% of not. what we're owed. It would not. What we're owed can only be compensated for through life. Exactly. Meaning they took our lives, you finish it. We have somebody in the comments telling us that T.I. should be praised and we shouldn't be speaking on him because he asked for, he trying to help black people get reparations. We not asking for reparations. That ain't what we want. What are we gonna do with that? When the, <laughs> when the Old Testament prophets were speaking to the creator about the crimes carried out, you know, by the kings, they weren't asking the oppressors to give them money. They were asking for justice. And justice cannot be delivered through any form of currency. Think ever. of just think about the idea of asking, just just ask yourself. You live in America. White people decide, I'ma give you, I'ma give you some land and I'ma give you some money. You get the land and the money. Who are you gonna spend the money with? Are you gonna go to Africa with the land and the money? I mean, are you? Can you can you dig up the land that they give you and take it to Africa, the land of your ancestors? No, you would have to till the land that your ancestors were tortured on. Right. You would have to the harvest the seed that is filled with the blood of your ancestors. Right. Even if you got reparations, you would give it back, back right back to them. Yes. So it wouldn't even make sense. On, on your part to even receive the reparations. Yeah. Then, the other thing you have to ask yourself is why would white people give you reparations? Why would it? You're not gonna do nothing if you don't get it, but why? You're not gonna do anything but protest and keep asking. I wouldn't give it to you neither. <laughs> Nobody's gonna just give somebody something if there's no repercussions for not giving it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, the black people are too docile to receive reparations. Mm -hmm. You have to have some type of repercussions for not giving it to us. And, and that's not gonna happen, so they're not gonna give it. In, in terms of, if you think about capitalism and the, the logic of capitalist economics, the black body was the first form of capital in America. That was the, the, the so-called startup capital yes, for America. it was. Now, if you study elementary economics, I'm not that well-versed in economics, but I, I'm gonna take the risk of saying that when you build an economic empire and you have uh, an asset, and, and that asset helps you kind of expand your empire to the point where you can dominate the world. Why would then the, the people who own those assets just get rid of it? 1865 Emancipation Proclamation, we think of that as white people saying, yes, this asset that built America, now we're just going to get rid of it. No, they don't get rid of it. What they do is they disguise it. They keep it going. How do they disguise it? Sharecropping, convict leasing, black code laws, uh, underemployment, exploitation of labor in every sector. This is how you take an asset and keep it going while under the disguise of reform, 
are new laws. Master disguise. We talked about this in the White Allies video as well. You have to be able to recognize the disguise. So, I, and I'm saying this to, to point to one central fact. Mm -hmm. Black people, and I say black people because not African people, because if we were African people, we'll be on the African continent or we'll be trying to get to the African continent. Right. But black people in America are an item in the investment portfolio of white America. Now, ask yourself, do you want to live the rest of your life as an item in your enemy's investment portfolio, or do you want to exit the investment portfolio? White people go land, house, boats, Black niggas. People. Yeah. That's, that's their investment portfolio. And even the entrepreneurs, because a lot of people say, yes. well, I own my own labor. No. I make my own money. But when you pay taxes, who does that ta where does that tax money go? It goes right to the U.S. Treasury. We left America because we were tired of paying white people's bills. Yes. We're not paying any more white people's bills. Mm -hmm. And we understood that that's what we were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, because white people have a whole savings, a whole pl plethora of money that they don't even touch. Yep. They just saving that for their kids, kids, that's kids, the, that's kids. That's the oppression fund. That's the oppression fund. <laughs> we was paying for the everyday bills, the groceries, the lights. That's what we were. That's what black people are doing for white people in America, mm -hmm. whether you want to accept it or not. We said we're not doing that no more. We're not going to be funding any any white people's light bills. Yes. We're not doing that anymore. Yes. <laughs> so now we're about to go to number five, and this is kind of just a build on what we said before, mm -hmm. and that's pro-black people believe they can vote their way to liberation. Africans know they must fight. So this is tied up into the kind of commercial kind of relationship we have with America. Attached to that commercial relationship is a, um, a citizenship relationship. Yeah. So black people, we believe because, you know, when we have birth certificates and it says citizenship, it says USA. <laughs> Therefore, we have the same rights as Bob down the street or Buffy on the corner. We don't have the same rights. You have to look, practice a spirit of discernment. Don't say what's on the papers. Ask yourself, how am I being treated? Am I, is, is how I'm being treated consistent with what's on the page? Because if it's not consistent with what the, what's on the page, then what they, how they're saying I'm being treated or what they're saying about my identity is a lie. Somebody and, lying. And we have to learn how to detect lies. That's an art oh that my we've gosh. lost. That's so true. We've yeah. lost the art of lie detection. We believe every goddamn thing that they say. If it flashes across the TV or if it's printed in the newspaper, it must be true. And I'm like, and we're asking our people to use their common sense, use their common African sense. You have it. It's there. I promise you it's there. And you just, they, they just bombard you mm -hmm. with imagery mm -hmm. and content to, mm -hmm. to make it real cloudy yeah. so you can't even sit. Because here's the thing. <laughs> a lot of white people's votes in America don't even count. And they know that. They say it all they the say time. It. They say the, the elections are bought by corporations. They had the Citizens United decision, which basically just said whoever has the most money, that's who's gonna win the election. So, and they, they even did a study through Princeton University, mm -hmm. not at HBCU, Princeton University, where they said the bottom 77% of the population has literally no, no effect none, on policy. None. And, and included in that 77% is a bunch of white people. So if they're disenfranchised, what makes you think you have the franchise? So we should kill these conversations about the election. The only E word we should be using is exodus only e word not excellence not election exodus yes because that's the only salvation we have when we look at how the political structure has been run exactly. from 1787 to the present that's how it's been run so we have to wisen up and stop relying on these kind of propagandistic appeals to citizenship right you know as a replacement for sovereignty right because all the citizenship talk is just another a lever of control yep. to get us to stay in the mm -hmm. prison to stay in the prison to make the prison more livable mm -hmm. oh now i can push the button in my prison. now i can push the button in my prison cell so it can't be that bad no no, no. you're still in the prison you're cell. still there and you have to also remember that white people although they may say that their vote doesn't count and they can't they say that the bottom half they don't have a vote they have the economic they, power they don't need the vote it doesn't yeah. matter they yeah. are white in america yeah. it don't matter who in right. office right. they're not gonna suffer although they may like to have the person in yeah, office that yeah, they yeah, want, yeah, yeah. it's not gonna matter. Here's the thing, you know what white people, and this just came to me, you know what white people are voting for when they vote in elections? They're voting for style. On substance, 
It's the same. Mm -hmm. Like they they agree whether it's Democrat or Republican on substance. They all agree on the international and domestic front. Yep. Internationally, imperialism. Domestically, racism. Mm -hmm. That's the policy. Democrat or Republican. So they might. You might hear these white people and don't be fooled. Complaining, Please don't be fooled. Complaining about Donald Trump. Don't do but it. Ignore. Imagine. <laughs> ask them if they would replace Donald Trump with Dr. Khalid Muhammad. No. <laughs> If that's their nightmare. Exactly. So you have to understand, don't look at the superficial differences in mm -hmm. terms of attributes. Mm -hmm. Look at the essence of things. Mm -hmm. What is happening on the essential level? What's how happening is, on a spiritual how is level? our standard of living decreasing? Mm -hmm. how, why is it that the, the purchasing power of black people is lower now than it was in 1968? You think that's just whoopsie daisies? No. No. Did we just stop working? Like, No. no. We're working harder. Americans are the most overworked people on earth in terms of industrial societies. So we have to kind of start using, again, our um, common African, African sense. common sense. Because until we do that, we're always going to be lured away by this appeal of citizenship and this vote or die, your yes. vote counts. Yes, and white people love to hear black people talk about voting. Yep. They love to hear it because the, it, it's an indication to them that you don't you don't understand what they're doing, mm. and they'll start the conversations. They'll come to you. <laughs> who they, you voting for? Who you voting for? They, yeah. And then now it's a whole. Now thing. you say you don't vote. They're gonna say what? Wait, what? You don't cooperate with the system. That That's... was a different. Now they're looking at you different. Now these white friends and these white family members that you have gonna start dropping like flies. <laughs> Don't be fooled. White people are master manipulators and master disguisers. They will bring up these conversations and lure you in just to see where your mind is, mm. to see if you're pro-black or if you're african center. Mm -hmm. And I can guarantee you, if you're african center, they're going mm -hmm. to be out the door. Mm -hmm. We don't get a lot of um, opposition from white people because they understand our position. Mm -hmm. They understand that they can't come in mm -hmm. and try to do that thing that they right. do with pro-black people. Right. They see our position from a mile away and they mm -hmm. like, you know what their response is when they hear us? They leave the room. And you know what they do when they leave the room? They're plotting on how to eliminate us. Yep. They're like, oh, well, they didn't fall for the trick of citizenship or commercialism. Well, now we just got to destroy them. Now we, that, and, and we got to make sure we don't okay. say anything to mm -hmm. other black people that yeah. would possibly bring yeah. them to yeah. start listening mm -hmm. to these black people. And the thing is, a lot of times white people, they choose who we elect as our leaders, yes. as black leaders, by yes. who they attack. So that's why you hear them going off at the mouth about people like Al Sharpton, mm -hmm. but they'll never say Carlos Cooks. They'll never say Khalid Muhammad. And they know who they are. They know They're, who they are. They, they have the books. That's yeah. the reason why the book is $500, because yeah. white people will take that information, mm -hmm. they hoard it, mm -hmm. and they make the price. They shoot mm -hmm. the price up. We mm -hmm. know how it works. Mm -hmm. they, un they know who Carlos Cooks is. Just because mm -hmm. you don't know, they know. They know who Dr. Khalid Muhammad is. They know who all these people are. Mm -hmm. They just don't want to know you to know yeah. who they are. Yeah, so they find <laughs> the most docile, book broken yes. black person they can find, yes. and they go, we hate him. And then we, like fools, <laughs> we go defend in the person because not don't be talking about him he blank and we should respond yeah we don't like him either we we follow Khalid Muhammad we follow our ancestors right. but we don't do that we fall for the okie doke every time every time okay now we're going to get to number six it's the last and, one uh, black pro black people think we are all quote we are all the same under the skin whereas mm. Africans know that we are irreconcilable opposites meaning What's good for white people is, is bad, bad for us, and, and what's, what's bad, bad for us is, is good, good for, for white people. <laughs> or, or another one, what's good for black people is bad for white people. That's another way of putting it. Either way, they're incompatible. It's like oil and water. Yes. Oil and water. Yes. God and Satan. <laughs> they, they, not, they, they don't mix. And it's like, what else has to happen mm -hmm. for us to understand that? One of the most clever things that happens is they play on our insecurities and our historically programmed self-hate. Mm -hmm. So, yes. for example, there has been times when a, 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 a African person or a black person mm -hmm. would get in an argument with a white person. And what they say? What do, what do white people, what's their kind of trump card to kind of get hurt your feelings? Go back to Africa. The reparations that you talk about, Mr. Neville, your people already got your reparations. Your reparations, your reparations came in the form of a man named Barack Obama. Please hold your response. You, my advice to you, my advice to you, if you don't like it here in America, planes leave every hour from Tampa Airport 
Go back to Africa. Go back to Africa. And then how do we respond? Do we say, okay, cool, that's the land of my I've been ancestors. already planning. I'm, I already got my <laughs> ticket booked. I'm ready to What's go up? tomorrow. I should have left like yesterday. Yeah. No, that's not what we say. What I'm we say is, I'm, I built this country. What you mean go back to Africa? I ain't no African. I'm, I'm American. American. I'm just as American as you. All right. Now what has happened, they've gotten you to disown your Africanness. They're playing on your self-hate. They playing know on you yourself. hate yourself. They know you hate that that's your they African, that. so they call you an African. When people look at us, white folks look at us, they ain't going to say go back to Africa. First, we already here. We already look African. But, but before we was, late, we, we, we champion and, and love and we have pride in it. Exactly. So they aren't going to tell us to go back to a place that we love. They can tell we love Africa. Right. They, they can tell you hate it. You scared of it. So that's why they telling you to go back. And so they basically, in the same way they tell each other to go to hell, they telling us to go to Africa. And in our mind, we think of Africa as hell. Yep. A so, land of savages. A land of savages. So when somebody tells us to go to Africa, we just get so, we hyperventilate. We like, how dare you? How dare you tell me who I actually am? Like, you do oh, realize that you African, right? Yes. But like we said, white people don't tell us that. They tell that to the docile, mm. clearly docile people that mm. wear t-shirts that say God is dope. Mm -hmm. And just random stuff, black aesthetic stuff. Mm. They're going to tell that to mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say that to us because yeah. we clearly know who we are and mm. we know we're African. Here's a corollary to that point that I said whites and blacks are, are whites and Africans, I should say, are irreconcilable opposites. If you are disowning your Africanness, or if Africa isn't in you, then that means Europe is in you. Something, the glass is going to get filled. It's not going to be empty. Something's in the glass. If it's not Africanity, yes. it's being a European. Yes. So it's, it's one of the other. All these points we're saying, mm -hmm. we're saying pro-black or African, we're really saying European or African. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's one of the other. Mm -hmm. What side of the chessboard are you going to be on? Mm -hmm. You have to decide. There's only two sides. There's not four. There's not five. There's two sides mm -hmm. of the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Which side would you like to be on? Yes. Are you on the side of Ma'at or are you on the side of war? Needless, imperialistic war. Constant, unending war. Which side? Which side? War? And, and, and we can even see this in the ways we practice our spirituality. Mm -hmm, so we can. I think about like, and you know, as a child, we think very literalistically. And I can remember the, the tithe and offering and they would say, oh, yeah. give 10% of your tithe to God. And you know, I'm like four or five. I can still remember this. Mm -hmm. And I used to think to myself, I used to literally think when you put your money in the basket, they would go behind the door and then the heavens would Spend open up. up and the money would <laughs> float to the sky. But then on top of that, I used to think to myself, 10%, like, I'm like, well, if this is the creator of everything, if he created the heavens and the earth and everything in between, then why are we only giving God 10%? Shouldn't we be giving him 100%? But here's the thing. Yes, that other 90 is going. Where's that other 90% going? Because remember, we sometimes in order to access wisdom, we have to think from the perspective of a child. Because the child are close to the ancestors. Mm -hmm. That's another trick the Europeans gave us. When they want to insult your thinking, they call it childish. Mm -hmm. But sometimes childish thinking is more mature than yeah. so-called adult Clearly. thinking. So, and so I'm thinking, so if, if that actually were happening, if that 10% of money were going to God, where is the other 90% going? Oh, the 90% is going the to your water guy. bill. The real guy. The real guy. The white guy. Yeah, the white one. Your water bill, your phone bill, your, your gas, your car your insurance, your your mortgage payments, all that stuff. And and so your we have movies, your, your content, movies, your your streaming services, your consumer items, your food, your bleached white food that you so, love. So so if if we <laughs> again, if we think from the perspective of the child, we have to understand how we spend is not just a statement on finances it's a statement on our morality yep what's in the heart what's in our heart what's in the mind and, and in our heart we was like we don't want to spend in a way that's inconsistent with our morality we can't say we love african people and constantly finance the enemies of african people it doesn't make sense incompatible incompatible so we have to reform not just how we think we have to reform how we act yes and bring them into a line we do and what we do yes we have to be prayerful. And to be prayerful doesn't mean to be on your knees talking to white Jesus. Prayerful, every night. Every night. Prayerful means aligning your thoughts with your actions. Understanding that the creator breathes through, through you. you. And then making things manifest. And From having that. no fear. 
as None. you do it. None. People are like, weren't you afraid? To no, no, not afraid. No, you're not afraid. I'm walking in the creator's purpose. What would I need to be afraid of? These are Christians saying you're well, afraid. Aren't you? What about the shops? And there's a lot of diseases there. And there's the lights. Where are your masks? And, uh, like we walk mask in, like and we had one commenter and I'm not even going to name them. We walk into Tanzania where people aren't as indoctrinated to um, believe in these kind of European uh, propaganda diseases. They're like, where are their masks? No life jackets on the boat? Yeah. Ma'am, ma'am. You know, everybody in Dar es Salaam is just ignorant. They just didn't get the memo. Or it, it might have been that, or they could just be in touch with their Africanness to know that if they're going to live or die, it's going to be up to the creator, not up to Anthony Fauci or, or any other type of propagandist who's pushing this kind of illusion of health on American illusion. people. The, the biggest illusion. You're, you're living in a fear-based culture. That's why you can comment on videos and see people not wearing life jackets and be afraid. <laughs> It's, it's very it's not it's not a good thing to be in you've got to get out of that fear-based culture our yes. Kathy talks about it all the time it's post-traumatic slave syndrome stop it post because that's what that's what slavery did to mm -hmm. the African mind everything this I, is how you live <laughs> I honestly believe before we encounter the Europeans fear was kind of like a foreign, a foreign concept. concept like what you what you mean fear like I, we know the creator what else is there to fear like, cause we, we didn't fear death neither. Yeah. This is why we was able to jump off the ships into in, in, into yeah. into the ocean and be like, I'd rather die. We'll be back. We'll be back. And maybe they backing us. We don't know. <laughs> they definitely backing us. Maybe because maybe Cause and I, I said that, I would have been the one. <laughs> I said oh. that. I said that when we got here because <laughs> I was like I was like during the um, middle passage, the the Africans who jumped off the ship. Some of them, yes, they just wanted to die. But I don't know. I I feel like deep in their heart, some of them was like. When I hit the water, I want to be rescued, and then I want somebody to take me back home. Yeah. And so a lot of them died with the with the desire to be back home. Mm -hmm. And if you understand African um, spirituality, um, our ancestors, when they depart the earth, they sometimes come back in different forms. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, these black people who are repatriating back to Africa, you can look at it as the spirits of those Africans who jumped overboard. Yep. And now that they are back in the flesh, they can fly over the ocean. The ocean that they drowned in, yep. they can fly over Get it. Get on now. a plane and... and... And that's what we're asking you all to do. Remember those ancestors who jumped overboard yep. and how badly they wanted to reach the shores of their motherland. And then ask yourself, why aren't you making that trip and you're not even going to risk drowning in the process? You can just get on a nice, comfortable plane and watch a movie on the way there. Why not? You worried about corona. Now the, now the fear is Dorona. Dorona. Stop with the excuses. <laughs> stop with the fear. Like, that's, that's what's stopping you and that's what's keeping you oppressed. So... Now we wrapped up our top six, yep, we and, did. and mm -hmm. I also want to talk about blackness. So as you can see, I think it should be abundantly clear how blackness is an impediment to yes. African liberation. Yes. And if I, could, if I could describe blackness, and recall, that's not a name that we gave ourselves. Everything that we've been called has been handed to, to us, us by, by our somebody else, by someone else. And whenever language starts to change, it's always in the service right, of, the of oppressor. that oppressor. Yes. So yes. who started calling you a Negro? It yes. wasn't you. Right. Who started calling you black? It wasn't you. Mm -hmm. Who started calling you an African American? Mm -hmm. It wasn't you. And sovereignty at its core is the ability to name yourself, you know, and not be named by someone else. Because there's power in a name. It is. There's power, not and not just not in the just name in of Jesus. Jesus. We, yeah, in every name. In every name. If long as you give it to yourself. Exactly. Who gave it to you? Yeah, yeah. So blackness for for me, and I I I know my wife agrees with me. We agree that blackness is a kind of psychological brand yes. to complement the physical brand that was on the skins of our ancestors. Yep. And and we're saying we're extract that. it, extract that psychological brand. Because that psychological brand has permeated the culture, it's permeated the churches, it's permeated the schools, it's permeated oh. our children. And as long as we allow that toxin of misdefinition to define our reality, then we'll never understand our capability oh. and we'll never accomplish what we can. We, we stop at blackness. You, you understand that there's a level. Mm. Where did blackness come from? Where did it come from?
You don't. You just didn't get black from. You didn't get black from being in mm. in Europe. Mm. You didn't get black from being in Antarctica. Mm. You got black from being where? Mm. Class, mm -hmm. Africa. So you 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 trying to divorce from that? You're in that constant battle, and white people love to see it. They mm. love to see you in that battle. Yeah. They love. They yeah. love to see you downplay yourself and change your voice and yeah. code switch yeah. and stand up a little bit straighter and walk a little bit different when they come in the room. They love to see it. They want to see you march in the street with weapons. Yep. You know, but not aiming them at anybody. It's just like- Just for fun. Yeah, just, just for the cameras. For the all, aesthetics. All, all black with huge guns. With, for the aesthetics. Ain't nobody shooting nobody. For the aesthetics. But it's, bla it's pro-black though. You can repost it in your stories so. though. Mm -hmm. We have to kind of understand the power of imagery. Yes. Because it so notice, powerful. notice, like if an image is widely disseminated, it has no power. The images that are powerful are usually the hidden from public ones. view. So think about the Black Madonna. You know, in the Catholic Church, they will recognize there is a such thing as a Black Madonna. But how many times do you see public displays of the Black Madonna? You don't. You don't see that a lot. And why don't you see it? Because that's a spiritually potent image. And we live in a culture where all of the images that we internalize are spiritually empty. And when you when you give spiritually empty images to a people, those people become spiritually, spiritually empty. empty as well. It's very simple. So we you have to get in the business of practicing a type of pro-Africanist or a pro-Africanism that makes our image a liability. Yes. White people should be scared to, to show us. Yes, they should. They should not be so quick to be they like, Black be, Lives Matter. Yeah, they should be like, don't show his picture. Because if I show his picture, they're going to be reminded of what they're he gonna said. They're going to start killing us. And if they are reminded of what he said, they're going to start. <laughs> Being black is not sacred. Anybody can talk about it. Mm. Who was the person that posted it the other day? Was it Demi Moore? The, the yeah. little white girl? Yes, and the boy. She was posting oh, about yeah. Black Lives she, Matter. She was kissing what? a... a underage boy on camera during the yes, 90s. Yes, and she, and she can post about yeah. George Floyd and all yeah. these people dying. Like, if you, and if your Instagram can look similar to her Instagram, y'all can post the same thing with the same hashtags, there's a problem. The National Hockey League has recently got on board on, with Black Lives Matter. How subversive How? are you if the National Hockey League... You're not doing anything, I, I can guarantee you. Where the You're whitest wasting. thing, I mean, where the blackest thing in the game is the puck. You know, most of the, most the of black the, is the, <laughs> because you, what you're doing is a joke to them, and they yeah. are laughing so hard in cl behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. They're cracking up at you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're seeing these Blackout Tuesday posts, and they're cracking up because you're not doing anything. It's all image management because they understand in moments of crisis you have to reform the image. But what what is the benefit of that? Because when you reform the image, you prolong the system. You prolong it. Every time the image changes, you have to ask yourself, there's a systematic kind of crisis at work. So they're reforming the image so that the system can keep moving. You know, nobody, and that's just basic kind of like mechanical, because I, I study mechanical engineering, but whenever you see a defect in something, you make an alteration. You don't just let the defect persist because the machine is going to fall apart. And they saying, they saying, oh, there's a defect. Black people are starting to see themselves be brutalized. How what many should we make do? An alteration? Let's say Black Lives Matter. Not Black Life is sacred. Not African Life is sacred. They, but Black Lives Matter. Ask the ask the people that are saying Black Lives Matter if African Lives Matter. Because mm. they don't matter to them. Mm. Your life as a Black person don't matter to them. They just saying it because they want you to continue being awesome. Or Black Lives do matter to the extent that it represents a rejection of their Africanness. Yes, yes. Long as you're serviceable, mm -hmm. your life does matter. Mm -hmm. But once you become unserviceable, Slightly. once you become unruly, once you become unable to be tamed or relaxed or calmed down or bought off, your life don't matter no more. Now Black life is a threat. Now African life is a threat. So black life does matter to some white people, but only in the sense that it's a rejection of, of your, your Africanness. African. So, wow, we really yeah, we talked about it we lot. talked about this a lot, and and we really we pushed this so hard because we feel that it was so difficult for us to make the transition. And but when we landed here, we understood the value of what we did more because it was worth every moment of, of strain and stress. Because now that we're here, we feel that we're actually in the uh, in the arena of 
true development and growth on a psychological level. Right. And, and, and we can't bear, you know, because we love black people, we can't bear to see black people suffer um, under a regime of power that is intent on annihilating them. And, it, and that doesn't mean it's going to happen all in a day, but slowly and surely we're being wiped out one by one. And it's going to continue to get worse. Yes. It's going to continue to escalate. They don't need black people like they used to. Yes. They have robots. Yes. Everything is automated now. Yes. You you don't you're not needed in America mm -hmm. anymore. So mm -hmm. what does that mean? That means you're about to be continued to be killed mm -hmm. at astronomical rates. A warehouse in a prison to mm -hmm. create a sofa. One or the other. <laughs> so one or the other. So, so yeah, please black people meditate on what we say and if it's making you feel uncomfortable, that's because you there, should. It, it should make you feel uncomfortable, and that's also because it's that's 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 the way the ancestors kind of call us to action. Mm -hmm. and they never call us to action in in situations of comfort and luxury. It's always in moments of adversity. And I'm saying, if you feel that tension in your heart that something isn't right, I should make this move. Listen to that voice, because if you don't listen to that voice, you will regret it. You know, I'm so glad we listened to it. Yeah. And, and I want you all to do so as well. So unless you have anything to share with our audience. I think uh, we touched on everything. Yeah, we love you guys. And we'll continue, as always, to produce content that is in line with the highest aspirations of African people worldwide. Yes, we will. Because we understand that united, we rise, divided, we fall. You know, and that's, that's a phrase we have to take back. You know, yeah. so until next time. Stay strong, keep fighting, and know who your enemies are. Peace.